Yeah, I had a I had a, a car wreck at age five that was a traumatic brain injury, and I lost the ability to speak for days and really had a, a severe stutter uh, for many many years. It was very very difficult for me. And I went to see a speech therapist in 1972 when I was five. My mind's eye, my legs are you know, hanging off the chair. And the lady was very candid with me and my parents and said, life is going to be hard for you, Harry. Every day is going to be hard. Every conversation is going to be hard. And you'll be drawn to be a recluse and a failure. And if you choose not to engage and push through, you'll be a failure in life and a recluse and very shy. However, if you view every day as a challenge and every conversation is something you need to push yourself to do, and you do things that encourage you to communicate, then you'll have so many challenges in life that the normal challenges of life will seem like stepping stones. And you'll be able to climb and achieve great heights, oftentimes more than many other people, because you won't have to work to get there. And I was like, wow. So to my parents' credit, uh, when I was there, they didn't say, oh, quack, let's get out of here. They don't know what they're talking about. They're like, well, this sounds, Sounds like a challenge, let's get started today. So that's that's what happened on that day. It was that day or the next day, I set a lemonade stand to sell and I'm, I'm, I'm a, I stutter. And when you stutter, E's are hard, F's are hard, and W's are hard. When you're Eric Weir with 50 cent lemonade, it's a disaster. <laughs> you know? So I had a sign up, lemonade for sale, and people would always ask, and I just I'd point to the sign, you know, and they would say, well, how much is it? Always ask a second time, it was terrible. How much is it? And point. And I, how much is it? And I'm like, it's 50 cents. And that was the best thing I learned because I never got 50 cents. I got, here's a dollar, here's five dollars. You know, have a great day, kid. And it was, uh, so I made $82 and 1972 dollars, which is almost $600 today on my first stand and lemonade stand. And when my father got home, he, he's like, well, how'd you do today? I said, I made $82. And he goes, you know, I'm not sure I made $82 today. So that was, that kind of got me launched into entrepreneurism. And uh, from then on, I was like trying to sell everything for my own Christmas presents, buy my own bicycle. So it just started haggling and doing whatever a kid could do to earn income. Probably the biggest thing is give yourself permission to dream. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? And almost every time people stop, like, I can't fail. I don't have the money. Don't, stop. I'm not saying it. If you knew you couldn't fail, what could you do? And it takes a number of times to really get your mind to think like that. Well, I don't have the education or I don't live on the right side of town or I don't know the right. Stop. Stop. If you couldn't fail, what would you do? And what that does it gives you permission to dream in a new way. It's been my personal experience and that of others. If I have a clear enough focus of where I want to go, what I want to accomplish, that focus and clarity will attract people with the right education, people with the capital, people with the know-how to get there. Try to separate the problem solving portion immediately, like I don't have this, I don't have that. And try to get a dream first and then, and then work your way backward and, and put, put legs under your dreams. So that's an important part of the book. And then making progressive changes. And then just how do you make change? You can start doing something new you've never done before. You can stop doing something you're currently doing. Do more of something you're currently doing or less of something. And it's so simple. There's only four ways that I know to make change. And, you know, give yourself permission to uh, make change, permission to fail, and permission to start over and make adjustments. So I think most people really beat themselves up over failure. But in the book I mentioned, you know, Michael Jordan, there's no one's ever missed more uh, three pointers in him in the history of the basketball. No one's ever missed more game ending shots. No one's missed more from the free from th throw line. However, he's viewed widely as you know, one of the top, if not the top, basketball player in history because he kept going. And he says, I fail more than others, thus I succeed more than others. And I think that that's the perspective is that there is no success without a setback. I went to meet a friend of mine, and this was, I was at Merrill Lynch, and he was an airline pilot, and he asked me to, I'm trying to say, hey, I'd love to manage your money, I'd love to have, do a financial plan for you. Oh, sure, I'd love to spend time with you. Great, great. Where can I meet you? Stone Mountain. I'm like, Stone Mountain, Georgia. He's like, okay, I'll meet you at Stone Mountain. So I met him there, and he goes, I've got an airplane, I'll give you a flight. And I'm like, oh, this would be great. And I'm just like terrified, because I had a horrible plane experience. But I really was trying to grow my business. I'm like, okay, it's going to be great. This is a Piper Cub. And I'm like, Piper Cub?
job. Oh, look at this thing. Looks like you can sling it with your two arms. You know, whoo, like a big paper airplane. So I'm like, okay, Piper, big, big rubber wheels. Hop in there. It's, well, how old is this? This is from the 1940s. I'm like, whoa, how about that? How about that? So I'm like, hey, wow, original interior. How, how, who knew, right? So I'm in this and I'm like, gee whiz. He goes, yeah, it doesn't even have windows. So, oh, you know, it's got these sides and the one I'm like, side? I mean, yeah, it'll, he says, cars will pass you in traffic. It's not very fast. I'm like, cars will pass you. And I'm like, I guess the only thing is we crash slow, right? You ever get going that fast? So, we're in this thing, and I'm like, I mean, I'm looking out the window. He's accelerating. He's really first, you know, and then all of a sudden, the tail picks up. Oh, God. You know, <laughs> then it gets a little lighter, bounces a little bit, and bam, I'm in the air. And I'm like, geez, I'm flying this little white airplane. It was horrifying. So then we go up to, like, 500 feet and circle Stone Mountain. And I didn't think there was turbulence, but there's turbulence at 500 feet around a summer day. I'm like, wow. How are you having a good time? Oh, this is great. This is woo, fun. <laughs> you know, so we come in and land. And I'm like, well, I see you want to fly lessons? I'm like, yo, yeah, I want flying lessons. And ultimately, I, I got a fly, flying lessons after that. But it was probably out of terror. <laughs> but that was unforgettable flight. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of crazy. I, I bought three at the same time. So I, uh, it, this is like my normal personality. I'm either not into something or I'm in it a lot. So, so, so I understood, I went to flight school and I'm like, I'm paying like $125 an hour to fly this old junker airplane. He goes, yeah. I started thinking, how much does this plane cost? He told me, he's you know, $85,000. Hmm. If you had a new plane, would people fly that over an old plane? think they would hmm. how many hours would they fly in a month oh we could probably rip this out 100 140 50 hours a month i'm like hmm. would they pay more for a new plane open yes they would pay more how much more I mean, 20 dollars like then my calculator out like 150 times 140 i could buy the plane for 170,000. i could ride it all off in one year i could buy finance have a payment i'm like this is going to work. How would you like new airplanes for your students to fly? He goes, that'd be great. Would you do that? I'm like, yeah. So I bought two for the flight school and, and they were busy. And the flight instructor, the guy who sold me the Cessnas was just eating late. He's never sold three planes in one day. And I'm like, well, I, I'd like to buy one for myself. And the guy's like, this just keeps getting better, right? He goes, well, how big's your family? And I said, well, I just had my... Mm -hmm. Got one son, one on the way. So he goes, Oh, you gotta have more kids? Probably. You need a 206. So I bought a two 172s and a 206 on the same day and uh, took delivery of them over at different periods of time and picked them up in Independence, Kansas, is where they make them. And I flew them to San Jose, California. Uh, when we'd get them, and flew the other next one to San Jose. And then I had kept my plane at that time in Concord, California. So then I flew from, so I got a well, nice uh, cross country experience as well. Because I began doing business uh, in Florida and I began having, uh, doing some business in the islands uh, and uh, going to New York more frequently. So my mission changed to were longer flights and I was flying with more people. So sometimes I'd have five or six people with me on a longer flight. And, um, and that, that was a plane that could get me where I wanted to go above the weather. Um, and once you go past 300 miles, the cost per, per mile is not, or is not that different than the King Air and sometimes a little cheaper. So when the, my missions became longer, I just needed a faster, more capable airplane. Uh, now I'm at the point where I've kind of changed some of those things that were taking me to those places are winding down. So I'm going to go back to a plane that I can fly by myself that might be better with a 250 to 500 mile range. So I'm going to go back to the King Air or back to like a Cirrus Jeff because I've, I've kind of gotten a, accustomed to the speed of a jet um, and to the performance of a jet. So if I can uh, end up with a diamond or Cessna Mustang is an interesting uh, solution. So these are all the ones I'm looking at currently to see you know, what, what would fit the most.